Hey up and welcome to the Temple of Blair. This is a conversation with a man who has the distinct honour of forming the United States' very first heavy metal dedicated record label. Mike Viney's career has touched the lives of many, many guitar players, either in this audience or beyond, uh, bringing to the world the likes of Ingvay Malmsteen, Jason Becker, Martin Freeman, The Job Law. But we're not talking about any of that, we're talking about fucking Roadrunner. Let's jump into it. One, two, fuck shit up. I mean, I started dealing with Case probably. Well, like I said, I know he. I know he sent me the Nuns Have No Fun EP. Yeah, and uh, he didn't remember doing that though. So, as I mentioned it to him years later, and he goes, I, "I don't remember that." But but it was at the very beginning. It, was that the first Roadrunner metal record? Um, yeah, it was the first direct signing uh, for a for a, a metal. Okay, I think there was, there yeah, was a couple I really. I mean, he did a lot of licensing work in those days. Um, and he ended up with Anvil, Anvil's Hard and Heavy. I think that was the first metal record that he put out, but that was obviously a, direct, a, a licensing deal from, from Attic. And Loudness, Loudness too, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, Merciful Fate was, I think, the first venture out the door. There was a few new wave of British heavy metal bands he had as well, like Battle Axe, Spartan Warrior, Satan, which were all sort of 1983. So Nuns Have No Fun was 1982, but knowing case and how we usually did business back then he might have signed merciful fate and then taken the ep as well if you know what i mean so he, he might have like re-released that and tried to get it around uh, around the houses yeah that, that's the, that's the, that's how i knew about case because he'd sent me that thing and said something would you be interested in something like this for the states and then um like i said he didn't remember this later so i i'm I'm questioning my own memory, but I, I don't think there would have been any reason for me to, I got that from him several years before we ever did anything together. And so how old would case be now? Mm. 80, 81. Really? Correct. Yep. Wow. So when case started, um, Jan van der Linden was the money though, in the beginning, Correct. right? Yeah. He was the, the, the bean counter and case was kind of the face and the, the risk uh, taker. I think this yeah. is what drove them apart in the end. Yeah. 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 Like, like you said, I mean, Jan was more of a, a I think a guy in the background and a, and a business guy case was more the pers- persona or whatever of the, yeah. yeah, of the label. Um, so anyway, yeah, we, I guess we started working together. I guess we probably started talking about doing something in 84, I would think. And then I, I guess the first thing I think we did was probably 85. Does that sound right? Or was it was 84 um what do i i made i made an assumption in my questions to you didn't i i think it was 85 vicious rumors soldiers of the night i think that's the first shrapnel record which you start seeing um you know what i think there's something before there was something before that um Mm. let me just double check yeah no worries i was just scrolling through discogs and it was the first one that came up with like an international release schedule so i was like yeah just hold on one second i think i think just a minute yeah, it would be Chastain, Mystery of Illusion, probably. Really, I think so because that 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 shrapnel ten eighteen, right? And mm-hmm. um, now why, why isn't this stuff in any kind of order in Discogs? It's a shame, isn't it? Um, there's no exact correct date, is there? No, Soldiers of the Night. Yeah, that shrapnel ten twenty. So Chastain would have been first. Yeah, and the question is. What came out between those? Um, yeah, London, nonstop, nonstop rock. rock. Yeah. Case took that. Case took that one too. So those other two would have predated the vicious rumors, probably, or, or came yeah. out around the same, or came out around the same time. Wow. Um, yeah. But yeah. So it was, it was good, a good four or five years before you started working together. Did you have any other European distribution at the time, or was Case the first one to offer um, that to Shrapnel? You know, I, let me think. Um, well, yeah, I used to ship to uh, to Bertus, and I shipped to Budisk. Mm-hmm. That was another Dutch place, B-O-U-D-I-S-C, I believe. And then I I had a license before I worked with Case. I did a deal with Manfred Schutz over at SPV, right? And uh, we we did we did one license, but mm-hmm. I wasn't really nuts about that. And Case saw that I was starting to release a lot of records and wanted to be a part of it and just, you know, communicated to me that 
basically he would be there with money you know, if I wanted to, <laughs> you know if i if, if i wanted to keep the product coming so we had a pretty wow. great arrangement he's very trusting you know and then, but i was worthy of the trust and so we we really never had any i don't think we ever had an argument i don't know if that's normal or not but i don't remember ever having any kind of argument with him it seems um, that to be he's, he's he knows how to conduct himself in in business affairs in the sense that nothing's personal and he knows it and he can figure he, i think he just has the social skills to to convey that so even if something yeah. doesn't go right he just has a way of sorting it out and and crisis yeah. managing which makes you know he, he's doing it on behalf of a business he's not doing it because he's upset about something you mentioned that yeah. the the spv terms weren't too favorable this is something i I'm a, i've got a complete blind spot on so what how would a licensing arrangement go would it be the licensee would pay like a flat fee to yourself for these records and they can just do what they want with it or was it you would export the shrapnel records and roadrunner would sell them and then you'd get like a a um a commission off that is that how it work uh, well um the way it would work is that as far as spv it was just one record and it was kind of an experiment right and you know it didn't sell very well and mm -hmm. so there wasn't really much much interest from me to continue, you know, continue there. And there wasn't much interest in them mm -hmm. to continue either. So it was, it was just sort of, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't meant to be, but no, you, you would enter into a deal with case and you would say, okay, well, you can have the rights to these territories for, you know, X amount of years. Mm -hmm. And we negotiate some kind of a royalty rate. And then he would give me some kind of an advance. And often the advance was enough to pay for, you know, half the recording expenses, you know, wow. some, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, yeah. And uh, so having somebody that's like that is very good because he let me do what I do and he yeah. trusted me to, he didn't try to really uh, A and R my label for me or whatever. He was more just like, Hey, you know what you're doing? I've, I found something that knows what they're doing and, you know, I'll make sure that, you know, my end's covered. I'll, I'll like uh, count on time and I'll, you know, my advances will be there on when they're supposed to be. And, you know, so there was really no, he made things extremely, extremely easy. And I think we had some pretty good laughs. He had a good sense of humor. I only went over there one time in all the years that I, I worked with him. I'd say I probably must have worked with him for about, I want to say maybe 13 years or something like that. Probably mm. like 85 to 98 or wow. something in there something like that. And then, and everything that I had at that point, he took everything. And that yeah. was the other thing too. It wasn't like he cherry picked, you know, he, he, if I thought it was cool and willing to put my time and money into it, you know, that he would, he would back it. And mm. I, I started a blues label and he said, okay, we'll do the, take the blues label too. So we started doing blues records and Ed Van Zyl, uh, right around the time that case cases company uh, was growing and evolving and we went to Amsterdam my only time there and I was sitting in a room with uh, Case and my partner in Magna Carta Records uh, Pete Morticelli who mm -hmm. uh, he was the, the president and, and really had more to do with it you know running the company um, but I started it with him and got Case involved and so Pete and I had Magna Carta up until the last few years we were at this uh, meeting and I think uh, they were sharing some of the new stuff that was coming out. And we played a Magna Carta record. And this really cocky guy from the UK, you know, uh, the song is over and he gets up and he says, I mean, really, hey, I mean, let's be honest. Who would listen to this yet? I would never listen to something like this myself. I don't even know anybody who would buy something like this. So, I mean, who here actually would listen to this? You know, he starts saying this right in front of us. I'm going, you fucking snot-nosed you know, child, like, like, you know, I've been doing this almost as long as you've been around on the planet, you know, uh, of course, that's how I was when I was that age, too, probably not, I was not rude like that. But but, you know, I, mean, I, I thought that I knew what was going on. And that's, that drive is what allowed me to, you know, start, start a company and keep it for 40 years or whatever. But we kind of saw the writing on the wall after after that meeting. It's like, wait, all of a sudden, the people are 20 years old, 22 years old, they're tattooed, they've got, you know, nose rings and and uh different colored hair and <laughs> it's like this is not it used to be like us sitting with case and, and and we were you know had similar experiences and it lived through some similar different decades but yeah these guys were in their into their second decade or starting their third decade and 
and and that was the move for Case to become a hip a label that that would put out music that would resonate with the youth. At the same time, though, I, I think one thing which Case is is known for is, especially at the time when when uh, the blues label came about and when Magna Carta came about. If I'm not mistaken, that's early '90s, right? Uh, yeah, blues label and Magna Carta both started around 19, 1990, I would say something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So this is when Rodrin is trying to expand beyond sort of thrash and death and into more sort of contemporary alternative places. Um, oh, okay. So uh, it makes sense to me that they'd they'd, they'd happily take on any other things that you've got going because it, it helps them diversify their brand. Yeah, I, I would say that, that that's probably true. But then, you know, eight or nine years later, there's a huge turnover at Roadrunner and there's more offices. Yeah. And, you know, there's younger younger guys there and, and so, and younger girls. And so, you know, <laughs> progressive rock is grandpa's music, you know, to, yeah. to, to most of those kids. And it was just sort of, it was just kind of insulting. You know, nothing to do with Case. Case was always gracious. He was really a gentleman's gentleman. You know, yeah. as far as the way he reported himself, and I always uh, appreciated that. And when you know we went to him with Magna Carta, he was extremely open, and you know said, "Okay, let's do it." It's funny mm-hmm. too, because right around the time Magna Carta uh, became distributed by Roadrunner, there was a label I think called SI. You heard of that? SI. Yeah, no. it, it, it was a prog rock label and run by a guy named Willabroad, and right. I think Case. I might have the name of the label wrong, but I think it was SI. But I think Case had uh, might have had some kind of a position in that. I'm not sure, but I thought that he did. I thought it was more than just a distributed label. I thought maybe mm. they were, because I think it was from that city or you know from Holland, and I, I thought he seemed to be more in with the company, you know, in some way. So I don't know if it was an in-house label, and they just they funded him. I'm not really sure, but you know, it seemed like that was kind of going, and then within a couple of years, it seemed to peter out that they the record the the band that they had which you know went on to make some more records was called everon e-v-e-r-o-n and i know that that so if you look them up on let me, let me look here real quick yeah. uh, i'll recognize the album si music oh that's what it says right okay yeah so, you're right and now the folks does label for prog music actually in the early 90s it changed its name to cymbaline records oh cymbaline yeah yeah so they did do stuff with roadrunner as si and then with cymbaline um <clears throat> It became, it fell under the wings of mascot. So it all comes back around. It's all about Ed Von Yeah, Zell. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so, so, yeah, I, I guess even after the, the people with different colors of hair and tattoos and whatnot were, uh, came in in their early 20s. Um, and I know this is a, a generalization, really, and I don't mean to disparage anyone who looks like that. I mean, I think that's, <laughs> that was a, that, that was a contemporary look, but it was not where we were coming from. <laughs> we is were, is that what killed the relationship in the late nineties? Was it just okay? There's there's a communication discord here. Nothing personal. It's just well, I, I think several things. I think that Case probably had his hands when I started with him. He didn't have that much product. He needed you know people that could supply product, and so I was good for ten records or more a year, mm-hmm. and you know so was Magna Carta, and so we were able to you know, keep stuff pumping through his system. So he's got, so he could expand, you know, he'd have something to sell and and could open up new offices and whatnot. So we, we were really good for that. But I think around the time in the late nineties, when both companies uh, ceased to work with case and we actually both began working with Ed, it just really had to do with the fact, I think that I'm guessing, but I think that case at that point was like, well, I can sign artists for the world and own their stuff in perpetuity. Mm. Why would I pay for, for half of recording and, (laughs) You know, yeah, and, and not and not end up owning it. You know, I think it might have just been a business decision at some point. You know, <laughs> that seems yeah. on brand for Case. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah. So I think he just, I think he just kind of said, yeah, this this was great. You know, and and the same thing happened to Ed. Uh, we worked with Ed on the same basis as this Case, but then Ed got much bigger, and mm-hmm. you know, Magna Carta left. Quit working with Ed, I think, before I did. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Shrapnel, but Ed was doing. Uh, you know, he wanted to take that next step and and put somebody in the United States and do his own thing. He didn't really need anybody over in America, mm-hmm. you know, to do anything with. He 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 was trying to sort. I really think he had the f- footprint laid out, you know, and, and the blueprints <laughs> or whatever laid out by Roadrunner. So yeah, he watched all those moves, and it seems like he was sort of making making similar inroads 
Yeah, and, uh, definitely. So he done very, very well. Um, yeah, to his credit, he's still still going. But, so we, we, there was a funny story that nobody really knows. The case had a very colorful attorney by the name of Jules Kurtz. <laughs> yeah. And people have talked about him. Um, yeah, you know what? People have talked about him because I know he passed nearly 10 years ago. So people have fond memories of him. Marcus Turner, who was Case's lawyer yeah. for a considerable amount of yeah. time, has a number of colorful stories about Jules. Yeah, Marcus is an awesome guy. Yeah. And there's a, a funny story about Marcus, too. Um, I'm all when, I'm here for it. <laughs> okay, when <laughs> Marcus never let me live this one down. Case was, I think we somehow build it up to where Case was going to take Pete and I out to a really nice dinner. And when Marcus Turner went to work at Roadrunner, he looked really young for his age. I, I, I didn't know he was an attorney or anything. I thought he was a, the next new kid that came in at Roadrunner. Nice looking guy, really cool. But we really didn't know him, right? And so we thought we were just going to have dinner with Case and sort of be able to lay out some ideas that we had. And we thought it was, you know, going to be just us. And sure. Case mentioned something about Marcus coming along. And like I said, it wasn't explained who Marcus was or how important he would be in the grand design of what would be coming next. <laughs> I just <laughs> thought, I just thought, oh, here's a new hire on from Roadrunner and Case is bringing this guy to our business dinner. And, you know, we would go to meet him every year, uh, you know, in, in Fr- to France and, and meet Case and have a meeting with him. And we really wanted his undivided attention. So it just <laughs> sort of seemed like, well, what's this guy coming along for? So I made that, I said something like that to Case. And then Case, you know, said, Mike, this guy's business affairs. I've just hired him. <laughs> I'm like, holy cow, this guy seems so young, you know? And so anyway, Marcus got wind of it and used to, used to tease me about it. But yeah, Marcus was great. We have the highest regards for Marcus. But no, Jules was funny because he had a very uh, unique voice. Mm-hmm. And uh, he had uh, some pronunciations of words that were, you know, from a culture that was, you know, before ours. <laughs> you know? So he also had a, I was very much driven by, you know, proper language and, and uh, clear language and uh, detail language. Yeah. 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 Detail language. And I wasn't, so, well, see, Jules wasn't for that stuff, <laughs> but I don't know what case was paying Jules, but there were times when, when, you know, Jules would think I was just, you know, beating a dead horse, you know, like, okay, no, I, I, I still want these changes in there, you know, you know, geez, <laughs> at some point Jules said something like, you know, you're never going to find a situation probably where any of this stuff will ever come up, you know, <laughs> you know, and so we can, I can spend a lot more cases money and grind everything down into minutia basically, you know, or I can just go with what I know real, realistically is never going to be a problem. Mm. And so, in other words, I wanted the I's dotted and the T's crossed. And I think he was an old school guy on good faith and just had a a good feeling that whatever things I thought were perhaps really necessary at the end of the day, wouldn't make much difference. And he might be right, but I just remember that I used to, you know, kind of wrestle with him now and then, but he was a very good natured guy and, and very, very lovable character. But anyway, Case was distributed by uh, one of his big distributors was uh, I think it was I think he was distributed by Important Records and Green World Records, yeah. And so, so he hits Green World I think with Abigail by King Diamond, and uh, it's just coming out. And he he made some kind of a license deal with uh, Green World, as I recall. Because I, I don't it's, think Case um, there's there's two there's two bits. So there's when he goes to the States, there's a there's a copyright issue or trademark issue with Roadrunner because Warner obviously own the, the Wile and Coyote and all that stuff. So he has to rename Roadrunner Road Racer in the US. Okay, but then right. he, he has two, he has Road Racer and he has two other imprints, which are Emergo and RC. Emergo is like right. the indie brand. Yes. Um, and RC is the un, what is going to be dubbed as like the underground brand. So Right, right. That's right. What, what Roadrunner would could perceive as their big releases would go onto Road Racer, which would go to Greenwald. I think it's actually okay. through RCA where this happened. And then anything else that's considered underground, therefore RC, would go straight to Alan and IRD. Oh, okay. So so um, you're talking about Alan Becker? Yes. Okay. So anyway, somehow uh, this King Diamond was a license 
with Green World. It wasn't like a, it was a different kind of situation. It wasn't like, you know, here, distribute my records. You know, it was different. There was a, it was some kind of license because uh, I called up the owner of Green World and I used to have a case imitation and a jewels imitation. You know, they were pretty good at the time. People thought they were, they were pretty good. So I actually convinced this guy that it was case and jewels calling him. And that, <laughs> And that listen to this one, and that the King Diamond record was released before King Diamond could approve the color separations. Oh no! They're like what? And then I, I I'm talking as Jules, and I'm saying no, you absolutely left the final you know sign off you know of the color separations to to Roadrunner, and we have in turn have King Diamond who's you know needs to sign off on them, and so we never saw the final we never saw a proof we never saw anything and <laughs> king diamond's really upset because the shade of cyan is way off from the original art and some of the other colors just something really happened that he, he seems quite upset and, and so, anyway i grabbed case had these uh jules kurtz had these contracts and they were pretty much all the same right right so i had these guys get their contract out and i'm saying I'm reading as Jules Kurtz, you know, paragraph one. And I start reading it. They're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Got it. Paragraph two. Got it. Got it. Got it. Paragraph three. And then somewhere down, you know, as I'm going through the agreement, I go, here it is. And then I start, I start just spewing out legal jargon regarding, uh, you know, final right, you know, of approval of artwork, including color separations and the various colors used and this and that, and that no, no records will be released without you know, a sign off of approval and writing, you know, and all this crap. <laughs> and, and I'm being case trying to calm Jules down and I'm Jules getting really ups- <laughs> excited about this and upset. And, and these guys are going, we, we have, we have all that other language, but this clause is in our contract. And then I'm, you know, Jules going, you know, don't get smart here. You know, I'm looking at the <laughs> thing right here. No, we're looking at it right here. And I go, okay, go to the next paragraph. And I start reading. No, we've got that. Well, then obviously this is there too, you know? No, it's not there. <laughs> so basically I had the exact same agreement for my record that they had for, for the King Diamond record. But yeah. I inserted just just emoting extemporaneously, you know, legalese <laughs> and, and landing on my feet, you know, at the end of a long <laughs> convoluted paragraph, giving all, <laughs> these right, giving all these rights to, you know, Roadrunner and King Diamond to approve the final color separations and, and get, a, get a physical proof of the artwork FedEx to them, you know, for approval before anything is actually manufactured. So anyway, after, after that, I, I told the guy I was just kidding because I, I, I'm not going to keep a joke like that going. I would, I would always do practical jokes, but I let somebody know within five minutes that it's a joke. I would never carry it on. You know, it was just being funny. So I don't know yeah. if they appreciated that or not, but I think, <laughs> I think I ran into him recently online somewhere. And I think I brought that up because that was one of my favorite uh, my favorite <laughs> moments there because it was just it, it, I actually was using two different people's voices and mm. and interacting as if they're two people. And, and it was, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. I mean, I actually was getting away with it. But anyway, that was kind of a funny moment. Yeah, um, feel free to ask me some questions. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Do you know what? Just while you're on that, um, of one of the one of the things I sent you was um, it was a heavy metal special. Billboard 1986, 10th of May. And a few pages into it, there's a cutting on the right side. And this, I, I'm quoting the date for the benefit of the, the listener. Um, there's an advert that says, don't get mad, get metal. And it is Green World distribution. It's all the stuff they were distributing at the time. And some of them are those Roadrunner records, uh, notably King Diamond Fatal Portrait. So that must have been, or possibly was the one you were referring to. Um, that they were um, putting out. I, think it was Ab- I think it was King Diamond's Abigail. Mm. I think is the one. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. But it's, just, it's just interesting when you look at this ad because I've got all these records, but all the Road Racer ones have the Road Racer logo on them. So someone must have said, you know, Green World, when you're advertising your services, make sure that people know that the Road Racer records are Road Racer records and not yours or whatever. Well, but yeah. Okay, hold on a minute, though. I think that the Green World name was on. I think I got one right here, I think. Oh, I have the wrong title. I think it was Fatal Portrait. But um, yeah. and, and by the way, I just want to make it clear that Jules Kurtz was right. I, I was too much of a, uh, you know, I over scrutinized everything, you know, um, <laughs> because I knew I was outclassed, you know, yeah. here I'm negotiating something with a, with a bona fide attorney that's been doing it 40 years or 50 years. And <laughs> I'm a, I, I'm a youngster. So I was always just trying to make sure that everything was, 
and, 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 and he was probably right. I was probably way over, overblown on that. Um, sure. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, Green World, right here. There's a Green World version of, of, of Fatal Portrait under their name. GWD90529. Uh, GWC, yeah. Ah, I'll send that, that clipping to you. Um, yeah, GWC90529, G. Anyway, yeah, the, the, so, so clearly that, that was some kind of a license yeah. to Green World. It wasn't just a dist- normal distribution. So Green World ended up going, going under... Well, that's a whole other story for for uh, the book that no one will ever write on my company. But anyway, I'll fire some I'll fire some questions out because I did have like a an arc to go down. Um, yeah, go. I'll go, try and keep go. it brief. So, for the benefit of of the listener who doesn't isn't aware of yourself and shrapnel, so if you've ever picked up a guitar and and listened to Malmsteen and shredded out and understand the idea and nature of shred, then you've had like an influence on their output and their exposure to shred in in some capacity, but. When starting out Shrapnel, you were you actually transitioned from a musician role. Um so why yeah. what was it that why was it that you, you decided to hang up the guitar and and actually get behind the desk? Well, I had the benefit of having a cousin who worked for various major labels and all through my life he would send us boxes of the promos. Right. And I used to flip out on that, you know, and then I go up and visit him in his house in Seattle, Washington. And he worked at a place where guys from all these other labels had offices kind of in the same complex. You know, all these labels were all kind of together. San Francisco had a similar kind of a building or a place where they were all kind of in the same, in the same area. So, you know, guys would just give each other their latest stuff. And my cousin would come home and just throw it, you know, stuff he wanted, he'd take into his house and put it in his collection. Other stuff would just go in his garage. So I go over and visit him, you know, on vacation. I could just go through his garage and pick a hundred records out of there, whatever he could care less. And I said, yeah, anything you want in there, it's yours. And I, I just, for a kid, just to be able to go home with 50 records or whatever would, was incredible back then, especially, awesome. you know, on money. So I had him and I, I went to the, went to a big radio uh, tip sheet. Uh, uh, it was a big radio magazine that, 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 that the, the, all the cool stations paid a fortune to be part of this. And, and to, it, it basically, let every station know what all the tastemaker stations in the country were playing and what everybody was playing. Everybody would report every week, you know, what was hot, what was getting reactions on the phones. And so, you know, I went to a convention like that. I went to CBS records convention. I, you know, went to conventions with him and I could, you know, meet these people and see all this stuff. And so I wanted to be in the record business and, but I also was quite religious back then. And so something had kind of told me I not, not the place for me. And, and I was, you know, so I got off that record kick for a while. And <laughs> anyway, at some point I just, you know, came back and joined a punk band. I went, I went to religious college for a while and then I came back home and, and enrolled in another religious college, but uh, just because it was local. Sure. And, uh, and, and I ended up in a punk band and ended up playing Winterland. And, you know, we were playing with the Ramones and the Dictators. We did eight shows with the Dictators at, at, at the Whiskey and, you know, uh, the band was actually playing the Sex Pistols show and uh, the, the Sex Pistols final show, the original band at Winterland. Mm-hmm. And that's when I quit to join these guys that were much better musicians. And I quit the week before thinking I'd play the Sex Pistols show. And they said I was, but then they got somebody else in that week's time and oh. said, sorry, we got a replacement. Oh, darn. But I went to it. So I saw history in the making. But um, anyway, yeah, I played with these three guys that later on, a year later after we broke up, became the news behind Huey Lewis and that huge you know, success. Oh, wow. So then I started playing with the guitarist from Quicksilver Messenger Service, which is a psychedelic band. That's uh, the Welsh Rockers Man, which mm-hmm. is a pub band from you know on United Artists from Wales. They wow. they idolized this guitar player pretty much and put him on the cover of their live album and invited him to come and play with them. And and so anyway, I, I had a band with him and a, and a singer called Rocky Sullivan, and we played the whiskey opening for Budgie Eight shows. And we okay. came back to San Francisco, played Bill Graham's old Waldorf. And uh, you can throw all this out, but I'm just telling you, this is how I got there. And then, you know, none of it's going to be relative, but uh, irrelevant. But um, anyway, so then I got seen by Marty Ballin of the Jefferson Starship, and he wanted to use me as a session guitarist to play on some stuff he was writing for a musical. So I started working on that with him while I was going to college and ended up uh, writing over half the musical. And then EMI bought that from us. Mm-hmm. And uh, I made money playing keyboards, guitar, and bass on this record. And Jeff Pilson, pre-Dawkin, uh, was uh, you know in this project with me. 
and some guys from the band uh, called Y&T, which are a metal band that has done very well for themselves over their lifetime. Anyway, I did this record. It came out on EMI. I got on the cover of Billboard with my vintage SG guitar, Pelham Blue color. Anyway, this this video, we did hour and a half long video, it, the album and everything got released about a year short of the home video market. So it was supposed to be marketing this musical shot live at the old uh, Waldorf. Uh, and I was one of the, the main characters in this thing. And mm-hmm. uh, there was no, you know, there was no home market. So yeah. the record, uh, even though EMI took out the, the, the ad on Billboard a picture of me and whatnot, 1980, that just kind of, uh, it went nowhere. So I thought, well, I don't want to be doing this all my life, you know? And so... I started thinking about going back to having the record label idea. And I realized that, you know, God, I'm trying to buy heavy metal records. There's not much to buy. I mean, there's a few things coming out of England. And so in 1980, I thought, you know, I'm going to be the first heavy metal record label in America. That's, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So I was playing with Jeff, Jeff Pilsen. And within a year or two, I hooked him up with Dawkin and he had a bunch of platinum success and has a huge career as a foreigner now the last 20 years. But anyway, I, I went from working with all these great musicians, you know, as a musician to uh, transitioning to being a label. And uh, the first record I put out, uh, I ordered 5,000 of them because that's how much money I, I had after <laughs> making, uh, playing the sessions for this record on EMI. And I put it all on the line. And my parents, all of a sudden, we lived on a golf course and they had to move their golf cart to, you know, help accommodate all the 5,000 <laughs> records coming into the garage. And my dad said, how are you going to sell them? And I said, one at a time, but <laughs> whatever, I'm going to, I'm going to get rid of all these. And uh, so anyway, he, he, he gave me some money for marketing and said, no, you, you need to do more marketing. But I, I did all this. I had a grassroots thing down that really worked out well. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, I got rid of them all. And then, so yeah, we just, I was just putting out a record or so a year for the first couple of years. And then I got to kick. I thought, well, if I could do this well with one record, what if I had 10 records that did that? Yeah. Well, that's actually some money. And then I thought, but what if the ones that I put out do way better than the test case? You know, then it could really be something. So, yeah, st- stuff started to do pretty well. And, you know, it wasn't, you know, too long probably before I first, you know, like I said, had, had some, uh, you know, uh, discussions with Case. Yeah. And, yeah. Where did um, the name shrapnel come from then? Was it just, oh, this is this is a cool word? Yeah, it, it, it's funny. Um I was thinking of, well, I, I want to put out the first heavy metal record label. And I thought of, you know, incendiary, you know, something exciting, explosive mm-hmm. metal. And I thought shrapnel, you know. And it's funny, if you go on and look up shrapnel records besides my label, you'll find uh, documents from hospitals in the war of, of people having lead in their butts and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, there, there, there are shrapnel <laughs> records out there of, of uh, you know, accounts of, I guess, people taking on shrapnel in, 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 in battle. Uh, but it's kind of funny because I came out with this name, you know, uh, shrapnel, this war theme. And I had guys in military uniforms, uh, you know, fighting guys with stabbing people with guitars and stuff, you know, and, you know, all of a sudden, then I got, I have to contend, I got combat records. (laughs) I got, got, uh, you know, a, a bunch of labels kind of, kind of jumped onto the, uh, the military theme and it really, I don't, I don't, I think I just pulled out out of the air, but it's amazing that there were a number of other labels that were pretty, uh, you know, competitive back then that also kind of went with that same kind of look, but I, you know, it was, it was the right place at the right time. Brian Slagle, uh, always the nicest guy and a real gentleman. Um, he was, I think, managing a record store and he was really young, you know, and, yes. uh, we'd talk on, we'd talk on the phone and stuff and he had a little, uh, fanzine. And so uh, we were in touch because of the fanzine and stuff. And then I think he, within a year or so, I think he had his first record out. And, uh, you know, unlike, unlike me, uh, he, he just, he went about it a lot better. I, I, I never really, um, I never wanted to have anything huge uh, because I didn't want to have anything I couldn't contend with or control, so to speak. So um I wasn't someone that wanted to have a bunch of people I had to keep an eye on, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it was never going to be a huge label, but I always told the artist too, like, Hey, if something else comes along, you know, we'll we'll work it out so you can, you know, I'm not going to hold you back, you know? So we, you know, Marty Freeman got a chance to be in Megadeth. So, you know, I I didn't take anything from him for that. I just, you know, let it happen. And he was grateful and came back and did his records for me. And Jason Becker actually went to, you know, 
suggested him to David Lee Roth and, uh, you know, and they, uh, you know, and he would have come back and done his records for me if he hadn't, you know, gotten Lou Gehrig's disease. Sure. Uh, poor guy. Mm-hmm. Horrible. Um, what a talent. But yeah, it, it's, I just really wanted to, I didn't want to be a loser. You know, I can picture <laughs> myself, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, years later be, being, you know, unsuccessful and uh, I'm making this now. I'm still going to make that tape. I, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not calling people losers uh, to be a, a pejorative. I know it sounds horrible. I just mean that personally I was, I wasn't willing to sacrifice everything to be, you know, a musician, you know, that, 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 that wasn't, uh, it wasn't as important. I wanted to be creative and I wanted to create mm-hmm. music, but my ego or whatever, it wasn't such where it had to be me. You it know? sounds and like a lot of, a lot of like the success of a musician, especially with your, your experience with the EMI thing, it relies on a lot of dependencies and it sounded like you wanted to remove those dependencies. Yeah. That's, that, that was a smart uh, assessment there. Yeah. I, I thought to myself, you know, um, yeah, I, that, that's the thing why it worked out with case. I don't want someone to tell me no. You know, uh, early on, uh, Columbia Records uh, uh, offered me, you know, uh, they wanted to talk about, you know, coming in and being, you know, somehow part of what I was doing. And I just started, we started talking about it. And I just realized, you know, this isn't going to be me anymore. You know, this isn't going to be necessarily my vision. And all of a sudden I'll have guys in suits, you know, telling me what to do, what not to do, you know, and I'd already managed a band on Columbia records and, you know, you know, I, I just, I just kind of saw how things could get from a corporate level, you know? Yeah. And so the thing about not having anybody to answer to uh, was great because if I, a lot of records I made, not, I would say that a lot of people might not have made those records, you know, and, and there are records I made where if you said, do you think you're going to make much money? I say, I have no idea if I'm going to lose money, make a little <laughs> bit or break even, you know, but, the music deserves to be out there. It's cool stuff. And the artist is cool. And I want to, I want to be supportive. And I did a lot of records just because I liked the people and I sure. like what they did, but I wasn't sure if we were going to have a, you know, huge success or not. So even earlier before case came along, uh, I had uh, Steve Mason at, um, he owned a distribution company called Winsong in the UK. And he also owned half of uh, important records. And Barry Coburn owned the other half. And Steve came over and visited me. And, you know, he he said, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd be interested in buying into your your label. And I said something like, I want to become like you. And I'm never going to become like you if I let you swallow me up <laughs> before I have a chance <laughs> to see what I can do on my own or something like that. And he, he was really nice. So for a while, he'd call and he'd say, oh, you're rich and famous yet? And I'd go, no, but... <laughs> You know, I'm I'm making some good music, and so he was a really Steve Mays was a really nice guy and very, very cool, and uh, and so was Case, and but Case just, yeah, there were various people that wanted to do stuff with me, but Case was the guy that just felt the most comfortable, mm-hmm. and you know, I, I I believe that whatever he said, it would happen, and I think Case's word was his bond, and that you know, I think. I think, you know, whenever, if something was supposed to be in my bank account by a certain day so we could start something, it would be there. You know, yeah. I, I never had to worry about him. So, uh, yeah, yeah I, I, so I transitioned from being a musician because I was also a record collector and I wasn't getting enough cool stuff. And it's, in the UK, I'll just say real quick, so Europe was coming out with some pretty cool stuff in 1980, right? Mm-hmm. But the States really weren't weren't coming up with much. You know, that's like, well, where's all these cool metal bands in the States? You know, I, there's got to be, I know they're out there, but, you know, where are they? You know, there's all this stuff's getting signed out of Europe, but what are we doing? You know, and then I think, also. It's really cool that the, the genesis for Shrapnel actually happened like some years prior to 1980. Right. That's, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it, yes. it, it wasn't born of nothing. You had kind of like a few, you had like a runway in which you were sort of like, um, meditate yeah. on these ideas no you're, you're right but 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 the, yeah but the other thing too is that we had disco and we had this cool music called punk rock which i was you know one of the first west coast punk rock bands to, to get any kind of you know press you know nationally or whatever and um you know we had and then punk got watered down and became new wave 
and um you know uh you know between disco and punk rock and new wave music and you know a, a guy told me who became a very huge huge industry titan but he was a friend of mine back in the early days and he said nobody wants to hear your dinosaur music this is before i even put a record out <laughs> before i would have put a record out he said that's dinosaur music no but nobody cares about that Jeez. and i said uh you know and it, it'd be a great story you can laugh at if this guy didn't become huge i won't even say who he is but he, he became a <laughs> huge 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 guy in the industry with with, with mega 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 uh platinum people you know uh mm. you know that he worked with but anyway at the time you know he, he was just kind of making his way too you know and he told me yeah that that's no nobody cares about that stuff but you're right it, it was you know like i bought iron maiden's record you know and i bought you know def leppard and i bought girl and i bought all that stuff you know that i could find you know uh coming out in the late 70s uh you know 1980 and i just thought there's got to be stuff out there but the other thing too was the second thing about shrapnel is that i was a guitar player and i thought okay we had Jimi hendrix in the 19 you know uh 60s obviously the guy in america we had van halen in the 70s obviously the guy in america it's 19 we're right at the beginning of a new decade here mm -hmm. if i get on board and start digging i might be able to find the next guy because no one else seems to be given a give a darn right now mm -hmm. you know they're focused on other other kinds of music and you know oh it's new wave guitar solos are boring that's old wave nobody wants to hear guitar solos you know, oh, disco, no, so, no guitar solos, uh, you know, and, and we have all these new wave records climbing the charts that either no guitar solos or hardly any guitar solos. And, and I'm thinking, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm 22 years old. I want to hear guitar solos. You know, somebody's got to want guitar solos. So that's how the U.S. metal thing came about. I went around to music magazines in every, you know, a lot of the major cities of the United States. And I got the editors on the phone, which is amazing. I could do that. And yeah. what confidence, you know, and I'd say, hey putting looking for the 10 best guys in the united states i don't suppose you have anybody in your area are you kidding me oh we got jim sales with or whatever we got mm -hmm. we got joey smith or whatever yeah we got a guy here that'll, that'll scorch you know you know your ears off or whatever okay well i'd love to hear him and then i'd say well you know i'm trying to get the word out could you maybe run something in your magazine yeah i'll run something about your search and see what people in our area you know if they send you some stuff and so i had all this stuff coming in from all over the place. It's so such guitar an player engaging back. proposition, though, as in, as in, because everyone yeah. has a guy that's like, right. oh, this is this is the guitar player of like this area, but no one's exactly. pro even now. You could even probably go out now and do the exact same thing and yeah. bring various no, outlets right. around the states and go, I want the top ten guys again, and you'd yeah, get a completely right. different list. Oh, I, I was completely, and uh, so what that did is it put this anticipation out there around across the United States that something was coming, you know, and it ended up in the LA times and the entertainment section, which was read by everybody. And it, there's an article that said, can you blow away uh, Eddie Van Halen? If so, yeah. Mike Varney wants you now. And they, I think they put a picture of Eddie Van Halen up in the, in the article. And I thought, this is great. This is his like hometown <laughs> Sunday paper, you know, <laughs> well, he was Pasadena, but this is Los Angeles, same, same difference, you know, suburb, but like, or, you know, related town. Um, and I just thought, God, this is embarrassing, you know, but like Guitar Player Magazine read about it. And Jazz Obrecht, who was one of the main uh, editors there, he wrote to me and he said, if you find these guys, we want to know about them at the magazine. So he invited me down to a, to a, uh, a party and I brought some young shredders that I found and they entertained people at the party. And I cornered uh, like the publisher, I think, or one of the other editors, Tom Wheeler and I said, "Hey, I want to write a column on unknown talent." I said, "Guys work their butts off, you know. They work jobs they're not really thrilled about, you know, and they yeah. come home and and they've got this thing with their guitar. They might knock back a couple of beers and sit down with a dog on the front porch or whatever and play some guitar. And you know, they they can't relate to the ten platinum rock star in his Lamborghini or whatever, you know. That their 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 reality is totally different." I said, "But what if we?" you know, looked, you know, for these guys that are out there in the underbrush and encourage regular people, you know, to submit stuff to Guitar Player Magazine in hopes that they could be seen in a magazine that has that kind of international clout. And you know, I was like 22 or something. I pitched this thing. <laughs> the editor goes, <laughs> I like it. He goes, 
So give me a sample column. So I found some guys and I wrote about him and I sent it down because you're hired. So then I started doing cover stories and whatnot. So I ran into uh, Adrian Smith, uh, Richie Cotson's birthday party. And I said, man, I, I interviewed you guys for guitar player when I was, you know, 22 or whatever years old. And, um, and he remembered, uh, you know, that, that was probably for them. That was, might've been their first big thing in guitar player magazine. I, I think possibly. possibly. Yeah. And, uh, because it was probably 82, 80, yeah, 80, 82 probably. And anyway, when the guitar player put out their, their coffee table book or whatever you want to call it, um, there's a picture of me uh, interviewing the band. And I look at us all, we're all so young, but it's <laughs> it's pretty pretty funny. But anyway, that's how I got, you know, from being a musician into into being, uh, you know, in the record business. I, I always had an interest in the business and I wanted to, I wanted to make music that I would buy that there was a shortage of. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think we'll talk about the virtuosity when we talk about Japan. And yeah. I think I can, I can bundle those into like one question. But let's talk about yeah. the state of the scene at the time because it's I, again. I keep going on about that um, that Billboard article by I think it's Philip Bash. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's super super compelling to me because at the time it's we, I think especially like these days for people my age it's hard to appreciate. Um, the impact of the Indian and how disruptive it was, right? So yeah. let's unpack that a little bit. So 1986 era-ish. So everyone deals with their bands differently. So I know like Combat's advances kind of ranged like, dramatically depending on who it was. Roadrunner's stock deal was about five grand um, and was like a, a 360 deal. So what was Shrapnel's strategy at that time when you were, when you were acquiring artists? What was your uh, modus operandi? Well, in the very beginning, it was, I, I'm a 22-year-old kid, so who's going to sign to me for seven records? I mean, seven <laughs> years ago, I was 15 years old, you know, so, <laughs> you know, it seemed inconceivable, like when I found Ingve and got him to come over to America, um, you know, I, I never would have thought to try and sign him to more records, uh, mm -hmm. because that wasn't really, you know, my focus. I, I just wanted to make good music, and... You know, I didn't have a board of directors looking at over me or, or f doing financial forecasts or whatever and didn't have really any overhead to speak of. So um, I think that uh, – can you say the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. It's okay. I was just wondering what the, what the deals were that um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. acquired the arts at the time. So, like, so, so gradu gradually, I build up a name for the label. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and getting Case, uh, you know, having him involved with Roadrunner, it allowed me to offer people a deal that would give them international presence. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, then I could say, okay, you know, I need to have more records. But the fact is that, you know, at the time that case was spending five grand on records, I might've spent 15 to 20 grand on records, mm -hmm. even 25 or 30,000 on some things. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I was working on Neve consoles and SSL consoles and, and I, I don't know what kind of <laughs> recording <laughs> situations you make a $5,000 record, you know, with <laughs> back then. But I mean, studio time for an engineer, you know, and a good studio was about, was about, you know, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying that um, I think that case spent, you know, quite a bit less, for uh for those records but see the difference was he put the other money into marketing correct so, yeah he's so, he's he so, was like so that was he really was... smart so so like i might have spent 10 or fifteen thousand or 20 or in a, in a radical sense you know something i could have spent 30 or i mean some of those records cost way more than that but um i didn't want them to um but um you know uh i think that yeah a case um he put the money into marketing. So their, their thing was like, Hey, we spend 5,000, but we'll put another 15 into marketing it or whatever it would be, you know? So his total output would be, uh, would include, uh, you know, uh, some kind of effort to, to grow, you know, an artist. Uh, whereas I, I was putting a lot of my projects together. They weren't even existing. Mm. So case had bands that could actually go out and tour and it were already bands and, I was more interested in the, in the musical output. So I'd be like, what if we got Tommy Aldridge and Rudy Sarzo from the Aussies band and put them with Vinnie Moore 
or well, not Rudy Sarzo, I'm sorry, <laughs> Tommy Aldridge and, you know, let's take the bass player from the Dixie Dregs, Steve Morris's band, or, or let's get Tony McAlpine and put him with Tommy Aldridge and Rudy Sarzo, or let's get Steve Smith from Journey and put him with Billy Sheehan from the David Lee Roth band and put him with Tony McAlpine, or, you know. So yeah. my focus really was not, uh, you know, bands and getting them on the road and all that kind of stuff like that. I was more uh, looking at individual artists for the most part, I had some bands, as you know, but but largely, uh, and some of the bands that I had were were completely, you know, w- we made them, you know, like mm-hmm. I found Paul Gilbert, he wrote to me when he was 15 and, you know, we kept, you know, in touch. And when he was 19, I said, okay, we're ready to go. And, uh, you know, there's some great music. Now let's find the singer. So I recommended Mark Slaughter and he did some demos and they liked him. But I also had some stuff from Jeff Martin, who was kind of was like a Rob Halfordy sort of singer. And Racer X said, yeah, this is our guy. So Paul's band Racer X, you know, uh, it was first Paul, then Paul got some other musicians. And then, you know, I recommended some singers and they picked one of them. And then we, we went. David Chastain, you know, had no singer, uh, at least not, not a front person, you know. And I knew this girl named Leather who had the Shockwaves album on Roadrunner solo album after, you know, after I brought her, introduced her to the Roadrunner family. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I said, hey, there's this great girl here. You know, maybe you want to do something with her. Uh, yeah, that's cool. The band Roadrunner, uh, not the label Roadrunner. Say it again? The band Roadrunner, not the label No, 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 no. I'm saying Roadrunner has got a record out called Shockwaves by Leather. Oh, right. Singer, I got you. Okay. The singer, the singer of Chastain. Yep, yep. And, okay. um, now, do you know something about a band called Roadrunner? There was a band called Roadrunner in the Bay Area. In fact, I saw you on a documentary by Bob um, Albandian. Oh, that's it, Christ, yeah. Um, on the Bay Area stuff, and um, there's a band called okay. Roadrunner on that, which make, that makes the rounds quite a lot. And every time I hear the words Roadrunner, I'm like, I peek up a little bit, and I'm like, what? Roadrunner in 1979? Yeah, no. What's this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that was a cool band. Um, yeah, nice guys, too. But anyway. Um, yes, anyway. Uh, so yeah, so so Le- leather, uh, you know, was a singer that that you know I was introduced to, and so I thought, okay, David Chastain, how about this? And I go, hey, I know this drummer Fred Corey. Of course, later on he'd be the drummer in Cinderella, but um, <laughs> you know we brought Fred out to play, and so I was putting things together, you know, on on the fly, you know, uh, grabbing this guy from here, this guy from over there, putting people in the studio. Mm-hmm. That was a different method than. You know, th- that was like an old, the old jazz labels used to do or something, you know, and, and you know, we get yeah. this leader and we bring in this guy that played with this guy and put them together. And so a good chunk of the Shrapnel records were, and even some of the bands were, they they were, I don't want to say manufactured, but they, you know, some parts of them sort of were, we were like, well, we need a great singer. Okay, well, let's try this, this guy. Or, it's interesting because you know, like the A and R arm of like most of these these record labels is is about finding bands that are established and have rapport, and that's what they yeah. make their gamble on. But for you, it was literally now let's just fucking put some stuff together and see what throw stuff at the wall, see what sticks. So how yeah. risk averse are you at this point? How important is cash flow? I guess the question is, if if we're putting these projects together and you're putting out about ten records a year, how many of those records need to make money for you to be happy with the profit and loss for that year? <laughs> Well, here's the funny thing. All I had to do is just be able to pay my own expenses. So, you know, I wasn't measuring. I was measuring my success by what kind of great music could I put out there? You know, could I could I make enough money to have money to make more records? All the time, my, my accountant would say back, you know, after, you know, years later, 25 years later or whatever, from when I started, the accountant would say, Mike, you make more money if you didn't put out any more records. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just, just just sell your catalog and the way the way it is, and you'll you'll do better. Because last year you put out you know x amount of money to make records, and then you only sold x amount, and so you would have had an extra x amount of money at the end of the year to put in your pocket if you didn't make new records. Mm. And I go, yeah, but those new records are are are, are, are the catalog of the future. So yeah. I have to make the new records in order to keep things going. Uh, and so I never had anybody put any kind of uh, I mean, that's the thing. Any other label that ever really, you know, lasted this long, you know, had a plan. I mean, I, I did get a degree in business and, you know, so I, I you know, I have that, <laughs> I have that, I had that <laughs> under my wing when I started. Plus I did that thing for EMI Records. So I had a little bit of some experience, you know, g- getting started. Um, I, I just didn't care. There, there wasn't any, yeah. there wasn't any amount of money I had to make. I just had to be able to 
to pay bills and, you know, pay expenses, pay royalties. Mm -hmm. You know, I just had to be able to do uh, what I needed to do. And as long as I could do that and keep continuing, then, uh, then, then, it, then it was worth it to me. Interesting. Um, yeah. I, I never looked at, I never looked at it really like a business because it was more like a life, you know, it's <laughs> like, well, this is what I do. I get up, I go in the studio, I make records, I put them out, I put guys together. I mean, the fun of it for me would always be, and that's when I used to play, you know, music too. I think, what if I got in a room with this guy and played, what would that be like? You know, what if I put these people together? What would that be like? You know, it was, yeah, I, it was really a completely different sort of business model, so to speak, without being a business model at all. But it was a, a completely different orientation or whatever. I, I wasn't, I wasn't saying, so, Hey, you, you're going to sacrifice your girlfriend and your family and get in the van and, and tour at least six months out of the year and not make any money and do this for five years. You know, I never, <laughs> I never said that to anybody. In fact, I would even tell some of the artists, yeah, I, I can see why you can't tour. I mean, you've got a job working such and such and you have two kids. So, mm. you know, so like I, I was a good label for a lot of people that didn't go out on the road. Right. But that were really great and could make great records. And so, yeah. you know, a lot of the artists I knew would never, never go on the road. And so it's completely you know, the opposite of what, you know, the, <laughs> the business model is for some, you know, I just thought, let the quality of the music speak for itself. Let the musician speak for itself. I'm not spending, you know, $400,000 on records and videos. So, you know, if I can just sell, if case can sell enough, to make him happy and I can sell enough to make me happy that at the end of the year, there should be, you know, enough of something so that I can, you know, I can keep going. And, uh, yeah, yeah. I never, I never really hit too many rocky times. I had to reinvent myself a couple of times, but that was always fairly smooth. And as, as things roll on and, and you start, yeah, not be, I'm sure it stops becoming the only heavy metal label and you have metal blade, you have yeah. combat and then road comes in in 86 are you feeling threatened at that point or are you, have you got your niche so well established that it kind of ha doesn't have an impact? It's kind of wave crashing over the rock. Yeah. I, I think, I think Brian Slagle and I, or Johnny Z and I, or, or any of the guys that were doing stuff, I don't think, I don't think there really was much competition. I think mm -hmm. there was plenty to be had by all. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I never saw myself as being in competition with metal blade. And I, I don't think he ever saw me as any competition. I mean, he was, going in a completely different direction. And actually the instrumental stuff came from me looking at lyrics on some of these records that I had, people were turning in and I go, I don't like this. This is dark. This is evil. <laughs> this is some creepy stuff. And I think to myself, what if I have children and what if they grab some of these lyrics and they come at me and they're like 10 and go, what is this here? Well, why did you put that out? Is that good? What, why did you do this? You know, <laughs> like, well, I don't want to have to answer to a, a kid. I didn't have children as it turned out, but a lot of what I would do back then would be dictated by, you know, what kind of a sterling, you know, clear, you know, clean reputation do I want to have, you know, to be able to be, you know, to pass scrutiny with, with, with a curious child, you know, and I'd also think, what about all these families where there's no, no male, you know, in, in the household, you know, and they're heavy metal heads. And I'm, I, if I'm putting out stuff that encourages, you know, them to uh you know to to act out you know and, and 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 do bad stuff or or you know embrace evil or whatever the heck you know i just i just didn't want to do that stuff so when i had this idea of the instrumental stuff i thought you know what i could do you know instrumental music and not worry about having to look over somebody's lyrics because yeah. i talked to an artist and i'd say look you know i have some religious convictions i don't want to make them your problem but I've created a soapbox here with an audience. And if I put you up on that soapbox, I got to make sure that whatever you're going to say is, is, is not misrepresenting me or where I'm coming from, you yeah. know? And so I'm, and, and as long as they tell you this ahead of time and you're okay with, uh, you know, letting me look over your lyrics and, you know, if I have a problem, you can change something, then that's great. I had some artists just tell me to buzz off, you know, and, <laughs> you know, some got really pissed off. And, uh, but the thing is, I told him ahead of time. Exactly. You know? Yeah. And, and yeah. I know one of, one of the guys was a, was a famous guy who had a bunch of some famous you know, records and I got him, you know, kind of on the way back up again. And I remember I, I had the whole talk with him. He said, that's fine. I'm not going to do anything like that. So he turns in some song and it, it's got some, you know, some 
irreverent stuff in it, you know, and I'm going, hey, man, we talked about this. Can, can you change this? And, and he said, uh, <laughs> he said, uh, hey, that's censorship. I said, well, I don't know if it is if I put in your contract and none of your lyrics will contain any of this and this and this and you sign it and agree to it. We talk about it ahead of time. You know, I, it's not like I'm now coming forward and, and going to censor you. I'm just saying these are just a little bit too, they make me uncomfortable, you know. And yeah. so I, the working with the instrumental stuff, in other words, it, it just, it made it so I didn't have to worry about that or feel guilty that I was putting out something that would be, mm. you know, that could be a bad influence on somebody, you know. Yeah, and fair enough. As I get older, I mean, I, you know, it's, you know, I, I still wouldn't want to do that, but, you know, I don't have any children. And I, I think anybody that would buy a record that I would have put it out now is probably not a kid, you know, so yeah. they probably have their, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they're good or bad as they're going to be, you know, uh, based on, yeah. you know, they're not, they're not probably young. As you were moving forward, quite US centric, obviously Case comes along and offers the international option. Um, but was there a point where you thought, oh, I need to, I need to expand here, or was it just an opportunity? Was there like a concern for parallel importing? Was there a, was there some sort of catalyst which made you think I need a, a licensing arrangement? Well, like I mentioned, um, I tried to do something with SPV, yes, and yeah. um, like, like I said, I, I just didn't really, you know, nothing against anybody there. I just didn't really develop a, you know a confidant there or whatever, you know, and maybe it could be that at the time case of English was better than others or, <laughs> you know, or, or the case wasn't afraid to get on a, a plane and come over and, and come to your house. Case was that case was that I think case came to my, it came to various houses. I had, you know, maybe a couple of times over, over, over our relationship. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I think so. Um, I remember him coming out to San Francisco area, you know, more than once and meeting with him. Uh, so, you know, he, he was not afraid to get on a plane and, and come out. And, and th that was part of the thing that really made it uh, easy to work with Case. So I could actually spend time with him and get a sense of who he is and go, okay, this guy's, you know, he's going to be I, cool. I, I guess it, the question it, was, more, was, were you looking for an opportunity or did an opportunity land on your lap? I think I was looking for an opportunity, but I think that also landed in my lap too. I, I mean, it's possible that I reapproached Case. Sure. He might have also, he, he, yeah, he might have also reapproached me. I, I, I'm thinking he reapproached me, but um, I think that was the case. But I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, but um, yeah, it was it was a great thing, and you know, it, it, there was a time when we go to these trade shows, and the shrapnel portion of, of his presentation, it, it was a, a pretty good chunk of what was happening there. You know, mm. for especially in Japan, like you said, with with Shusuke, uh, you know, and and Ap Ap Apollon. Uh, Far East Metal Syndicate, <laughs> whatever you, whatever you want to call those brands. Um, Shusuke was a great guy, and I really am grateful for his enthusiasm for you know my records. Yeah, you know there's a there is a shrapnel book, and it's there's like two of them, but they're both put out by Young Guitar. I I have to look at both of them, but one of them's like you know like 70, 80 percent shrapnel stuff. Mm -hmm. they, I, mean, I think they both are, but you know they've got like every album cover pictured. <laughs> something written about every record interviews with various artists interview with me. Uh, I remember uh, Brian Slagle had a book done, uh, you know, uh, on metal blade. And he goes, yeah, they're, uh, they're putting out my book. And I said, uh, Oh, that's cool. I said, uh, closest thing I've got is, is I've got a couple of things out of Japan. I said, but, and he goes, Oh, what kind of advantage did you get? And I said, advance i said i was just grateful that somebody wanted to write something uh yeah i mean my my my, my label really the the people that really have that, that seem to revere it to this day are, are the guitar fans you know it's it's really more of a guitar shred niche label i think than than than, than you know than a heavy metal label and then also mm -hmm. the fact that we had blues bureau which was almost 100 blues releases or maybe 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 over a hundred. I can't remember. And Tone Center, which was you know around the same thing, somewhere close to a hundred uh, jazz fusion label. Uh, I'm sorry, jazz fusion releases. Yeah, the, I don't know. the 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 channel to Japan through Roadrunner was. I think it was quite unique. I don't know. There's. An, I don't know if there's a lot of other operations um, dealing with the Far East Metal Syndicate. But did you did Re did Roadrunner have a reputation by the point you you signed up with Case, which was what 1985? Did you know? No. Okay, th this is definitely a reliable licensing brand, and this is definitely a um, 
a, a vehicle that I want to use? No, not really. I mean, I, I kind of saw him as being a guy that was kind of doing what I was doing, but, but a little bit different, you know, and, mm. and doing it from over there and that he was set up in a position by distributing his own records, you know, through this system to put my records out through the same system. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, he, he, uh, Roadrunner was not, not, not really big, you know, in 1984 when we started, right. Okay. You know, p- p- putting, putting the, putting this thing together, 85, um, they were just kind of getting going. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but case was a senior executive kind of guy. And, you know, I mean, he's almost 20 years older than I am. So, you know, he had a lot of experience and yeah. he, he was a guy you could learn from. And, uh, and, and, and he just had that charisma or kind of character that kind of came across and you go, yeah, I, I do business with this guy. Did you ever learn anything from him? As in, from the way he did things, did he ever sit you down and go, this is how you want to do business? <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that. <laughs> no, nothing that dramatic, but, you know, just, just admired. I mean, for me, I never wanted to really, I never wanted to travel very much. Uh, Case offered in Chusuke uh, to, to fly me to Japan for these nice trips, you know, more than once. And I never, I never wanted to go. I only went to to the main office in, in uh, Amsterdam uh, one time, and of all, out of all those years, <laughs> and I just didn't really like traveling. And uh, there was only so, you know, much work I wanted to do, and I didn't want to lie awake worrying about somebody screwing up what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to make happen. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> um, Case had the benefit of seeing a structure uh in polygram you know and and seeing you know like a corporate flow chart of you know how these different uh areas of responsibility are handled under you know each person's uh control and so he knew how to build that you know that company and for me i mean i never built a company i was 22 years old out of business school so I, i was just you know kind of winging it and working with someone that, that was that driven. So I remember just thinking, gosh, this guy was just in New York. Now he's in Japan two weeks later. Now he's over here. <laughs> like, you know, I've been, I've been married now. This is 40, it'll be 40 years. So I had just taken delivery of 5,000 U.S. metal albums to my parents' garage uh, the week before I got married. Oh, wow. And um, so my wife and I have been together that long, but. You know, one reason why I didn't pursue being a musician is I realized if everything went the way I wanted it to go, I, I'd be out of the house for months out of the year for the mm-hmm. rest of my life. And it didn't, didn't make any sense to want to get married and then want to be gone all the time. So, and, and, and the same thing was for the business. Like, I, I didn't want to create something that was so unwieldy that I, you know, weighted down by by all this, you know, bureaucracy and whatnot and, and yeah. things have to be go through all these channels to get something done and and I, you know i i didn't i just never wanted to have anything that that complicated I, I just wanted to keep it really really easy so that's really why uh you know that's really why i never i didn't really have ambitions I, I, I didn't have ambitions of having offices in other countries i didn't have ambitions of i, I just wanted to be able to be comfortable and make good music that's that's so you must really have been a, pleasantly surprised to see just how successful shrapnel was in japan oh yeah i definitely i definitely was and um i don't think i really probably even know the magnitude of it uh but i know that we yeah i mean there wasn't a ton of money coming back this way because by the time case had to get paid from them and then case had to get you know something to me and then i got to cut that out and give something to the artist Mm. and back then Records weren't going for that much money. Uh, when I started uh, through the a lot of the bigger bigger selling records, I was getting four dollars and fifteen cents wholesale from the record. So with that, you got to pay mechanical royalties, manufacturing, shipping. You yeah. Know, it's just, yeah. You know, and and nothing selling huge quantities of records. A, a couple did pretty well, but you know, not like I had gold still records. Do well, there. in Japan, is it still is it still like a because the thing the angle I've got here is is I think Japan responds as a market to like the virtuosity. 
Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think they appreciate te technical things and and, and 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 high performance things. And yeah, uh, I'm not really. There's a couple labels in Japan that uh, were still, you know, doing stuff with me, and I've even licensed. I licensed uh, something to Japan probably three, four years ago, um, but that's probably the latest latest I've, you know, licensed anything to Japan. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've been pretty much retired for quite a while. It, it's just everything has changed. Uh, it, it, I never, I didn't want to have anybody but but you know iTunes and a main physical distributor. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to have five hundred digital partners and have to f feel all this crazy stuff coming in. Cause it would just be to me, I thought this is going to be an accounting nightmare. I get fractions of pennies, you know, coming in and all this stuff. It just seemed really too complicated for me. And, and, sure. and to have to hire somebody to do that when the records, this is the niche, right? So, you know, like I said, only, you know, a, a, only a limited number of things really did, you know, really well. Yeah. And a lot of stuff didn't do well at all. <laughs> and, and I'd say the the average thing you know did did okay enough to to make it worthwhile. So yeah, and yeah. then so the the top end stuff and the low end stuff kind of wiped each other out. So I'm sort of <laughs> sort of just kind of in the middle, you know. Was and, uh, uh, was did did Case try and push the idea of a a joint venture with you in Japan? Yeah, he did actually. Um, a couple of times he uh, mentioned buying into the company, but again. You know, the idea of being responsible, I mean, like I said, I, I talked to Columbia Records about it too, you know, and and just the idea of being accountable to somebody else was, I just didn't want someone to tell me, you know, you can't make that record. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I made all kinds of records my accountant told me I shouldn't make, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> I, wanted, I, I wanted to make those records. And, and you know, even if only, you know, 5,000 people would, would buy them, you know, and I'm spending X amount of money, and at the end of the day, I'm I'm making or losing three or four thousand dollars. I didn't care as long as I was able to, out. yeah, as long as I was able to take that to make it happen. And I remember a friend of mine, I got some killer band approached me, and but you know they really weren't. I say killer, meaning it pushed all my buttons, but <laughs> knowing how picky. And selective the labels are now, the Roadrunner type labels now, uh, you know, even Metal Blade or, or Nuclear Blast or whatever, you know, it's, it's not easy to get signed by a label, you know, nowadays. And, yeah. um, and so, and a friend of mine said, "Well, Mike, why don't you let somebody else sign that band, and then you can buy a copy of the CD for fifteen bucks to save yourself ten grand or whatever." And I, <laughs> I said, "You know." That's pretty wise. That was Pete Morticelli through that one at me, my partner in Magna Carta. <laughs> um, I thought that's pretty good advice, Pete. Let somebody else put it out, you know, or I'd be like, God, I'm getting, these guys are trying to outbid me. I'm already up to X amount of money, you know, and, you know, and, and he'd go, well, let them have it and just buy a copy of it, you know, because it's too, you're, it's already up that kind of thing. I mean, that's not that exact quote, but that, that was the gist of it. Like let somebody else put the money out. And as a fan, you can enjoy the music, you know, you don't have to, put your wallet where your fan fandom is, you know, um, Thinking of, um, of, of the kind of stuff you liked and, and the kind of artists that you brought on board. Did you ever get the great cat knocking on your door? I never did. But if I had got the great cat knocking on my door, it wouldn't have been something that it would not have been for me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the, 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 the great cat was, and I have nothing against the great cat whatsoever, you know, and, and she, she definitely has some talent and certainly can say some interesting things. So I, I think she was had all the makings of, a, of an interesting artist. It's just that, you know, we we had a certain with Ingve, Paul Gilbert, Greg Howe, Richie Kotzen, Marty Freeman, Jason Becker, Greg Howe, on and on and on. You know, it's not like she's going to go and blow those guys off stage or anything. <laughs> Still going, you know? though. Still at it? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's great. I mean, I, yeah. I, I think it. When I, I hear that she's out there doing it, I think it's cool. But I'm just yeah. saying, you know, that that I had postal vats full of people's demo tapes, and mm. I, I could not. There's not enough time for me to actually, you know, open everything up because at one point they were just coming in and coming in and coming in and coming in. It was just like overwhelming. Yeah. You know, generally speaking, uh, 
Roadrunner provided a way for me to get my records out into other countries. And that made Shrapnel more desirable to artists and managers. It's kind of funny too, because like I think there are probably some artists that went over to Japan and, and played over there before they ever toured here, you know, under their own name. Mm. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. And you know, I, I guess, I guess I, I sort of what would happen is I, uh, I'd talk to people, and you talk to someone like Greg Howe or Richie Kotzen and or Jason or Marty, you know, and Marty Freeman and you, you, Jason Becker, you know, this is what these guys are going to do for the rest of their lives. Yeah. <laughs> they, they weren't like me going, well, I could do this. I could also run a label and be happy, or I could also go do this. I mean, they, these guys were artists that were not going to, uh, you know, take no for an answer. Yeah. And, 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 and it would be guys like that that would send me demo after demo and, and just, you know, they, they, they wouldn't stop until, you know, they met their objective. If they wanted a record deal, I would get, if I said, hey, I want four songs by next week or whatever, I mean, they, they would, they would work really hard. And so it's sort of like, okay, I need a quarterback. If I hand you the ball, I want to know you're going to be able to get over the line there. So there are all kinds of people that I could have worked with, but I really tried to pick, pick, pick people who would be still going, you know, 20, 30 years later, like, yeah. like that's what I wanted. I, I realized that my catalog was, you know, ultimately going to be only as good as people's interest in these artists. Mm -hmm. But I figured if the artists driven like that, that, you know, th they, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't back down. A lot of the people whose demos sat in my, my postal vats, you know, <laughs> but most of which I listened to, sometimes other people listen to them for me, but uh, mostly I listened to them. But, you know, a lot of those guys, you know, they got married and took a job working for whatever. And they they became the guys that I wrote the guitar player magazine column for, <laughs> you know, like yeah. the, the talented guys that, you know, just, you know, couldn't figure out like a way to to, to, to raise kids and, you know, and play guitar. So um, but I I seem to I don't know, I feel really good that most of these guys that I picked, you know, that's who they were. They're still out there doing it. Bumble I think there's something to be please. said about, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier in terms of when you migrated from a musician role to a, a business role, it was about potentially removing dependencies and just making things happen. And I think you're right. those kind of personalities gravitate towards each other very, really well. You, so, know, you, you're, you, you know, that's a good point. Like Richie Costin, for instance, um, we made a first album was instrumental. Okay. So I think I, I think I might have introduced him to Ivan as guitars. I'm not sure. I had other artists that Ivan is, so it makes sense I might have introduced him there, but I, I'm not sure. He could have found his own way there. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we had a we had a huge NAM show booth at Ivan as and Racer X was playing in there and Joy Tafoya and you know Richie Kotzen, I think, and you know, there's just various shrapnel artists. There might have been, I think Kotzen, might have been a year before Richie. I just remember that one of the one of the Chicago NAM shows. Richie played with opening for Steve Vai and Richie came out there and just killed it. You know, his first album, I got Steve Smith from journey on it with Stu Ham, the bass player for Joe Satriani yeah. to play, to play with an unknown, you know, guy, Richie came out and kicked so much ass. Uh, he had his own rhythm section from home, but kicked ass. I remember I just said something like we're making a vocal album next time, you know, and <laughs> you know, what do you sing like? And he said, well, I mean, I've, I've sung some backgrounds in a, in a cover band or whatever. I said, well, what we're going to, we'll cultivate some kind of voice. You know, I might even use Jimi Hendrix as a reference. Like is, <laughs> we'll come up with something that, that works. And yeah. I remember I asked him after a while, I could tell that he could actually sing. And I think he was surprised himself, but he's one of those guys, like I talked about, he just will not quit. He, he will find a way to do something. And so, um, Anyway, I gave him a, a song by Free, Paul Rogers uh, track. And I suggested he do a cover of that, just, you know, see how he sounds on that. And he sang it, and, and I played it for Eric Martin, who was a singer for a band called Mr. Big that I helped hook him up with, hook Eric up with. And Richie later played with the band, but I played Eric Richie, and Richie was still an, an unknown guy pretty much. And Eric said, yeah, that guy sounds too much like Paul Rogers. And I said, yeah, he's been singing for three months. <laughs> so, you know, that, <laughs> that's, that shows you what kind of talent Richie Kotzen had. He just, yeah. 
put put his mind to it and he was just he was just great yeah i i i guess that's all i'm saying these Mm -hmm. kind of people they're still out there doing it yeah and i I could have picked 20 different guys and none of them would be um playing right now yeah you could have wrapped up in 1985 and that'd have been it yeah yeah i mean it, it definitely definitely there was something in the selection of these people it went beyond talent it had to do with drive and character and you know how serious they were about you know being great i mean it, it was it was quite a while before i ever i think had a shrapnel artist who drank or or smoked a cigarette i remember uh, one artist came to the studio to make a record and i go wow you smoke i, go, I haven't had one i haven't had a smoker yet you know <laughs> just kind of joking around and some of the guys once they got on their feet and and started you know playing and and touring or whatever you know then they 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 learned about alcohol but most of these guys were were so serious about playing music that they they put everything off to the side and just focused on being great you know just like if they were just like if they were athletes yeah 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 exactly you're right have you got uh have have i missed any other stories or anecdotes that um might be Um, poignant here um, with a case or um, any dealing with Monty or Monty Connor or anything like that. Just, just I'll just. I didn't mean to put um, you on the spot. It's okay if there's not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. The, the, there's a good Monty Connor story. I was just, <laughs> telling, I was just telling this today. Monty okay. Connor is one of the great, the greatest guys, and the fact that Case had the good sense to to see that in him and hire him when he was like 21 years old or whatever. How old was he when 20? What are you 20? Something right? like that. He's fresh out of uni, uh, fresh out of college. So <laughs> 21, 22. Yeah. I mean, Ma- Ma- and Monty's a, a tough nut to crack these days. As far as like, if you're a band and you want to get signed by his label, I mean, you know, you're going to be the upper, upper, you know, fraction of a percent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Cause I, I've sent him some stuff that I think, that I think is really good. And he would go, no, nah. you know, and I go, okay. You know, and then, but that's the whole thing. See, he's got the postal vats now coming to him, you yeah. know, and he's got all this stuff, you know, and so what may seem like something great to me, he could have 20 of them that good sitting on the floor there. But uh, yeah, the one Monty story, uh, which is kind of a case story. I don't know quite how to tell this, but. We can I, always, uh, we can always like edit it or. Um... Yeah, well, I mean, basically, there was an artist, a band that I was working with, had been working with. And this artist was a lot more hardcore and tough and I'd say kind of scary. And he had some very pronounced tattoos. And <laughs> uh, and so the, the, the band was afraid of him. Mm-hmm. And they didn't, they didn't know how to... <laughs> How to get how to get away because th- they were afraid. So I'm t- I told this story to Case, and he just kind of said something. Well, that sounds like the kind of guy we'd like to have a roadrunner, you know. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm thinking, really? And then so Case told me, you know, hey, talk to Monty and have him send you a box of the new our new promos, you know, of the new stuff we have. So I called Monty up like a few weeks later, and I go, uh, hey, uh, Case told me to call you about those promos. And he goes. Yeah, he told me not to give them to you until you until you give us the name of that guy, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, with 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 all with, with with the wild tattoos and the. And, and I wish I could say the whole story, but I, I just wouldn't want it to go in a book. But oh, that's um, cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it's uh, it was just kind of funny though because for someone like me and these young kids that were you know pretty clean cut, this guy was the real the real McCoy, you know, real hardcore <laughs> dude, and. Definitely, these other guys were, were 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 kids, you know, and it was it was just kind of a scary scenario. But that's kind of when Roadrunner kind of made that transition into doing all that super heavy stuff, and some of that stuff is super dark. And you know, some of the characters that probably play in some of those bands, you might not want to have at your Thanksgiving table. I mean, a lot of them you probably would, but a lot of you probably wouldn't uh, as well. But because, in other words, like the more outrageous, the more wild, the more on the verge of being arrested. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, that 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 stuff sells, but that kind of brand. stuff never really didn't really appeal to me because I I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't in that into that in that world. 
into that 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 that, that, that heavy music. But yeah. there, there was another another situation where I I sent Monty something, you know, around 2003, and uh, and he goes, "Oh man, this is great! I I really like this." I go, "Cool," and uh, it was funny because. I wanted to sign the band and I really liked them. And, uh, but they gave me their demo and it, it, it had F bombs, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout. And I said, I don't get it. You're not, your music isn't even, <laughs> you know, lyrically or, or heavy, you know, it was almost kind of like, like, like seventies blues rock, like grand funk or something, you know, it was definitely not, not something where you'd expect to hear those, you know? <laughs> and I just said, I don't want to have to put a parental advisory sticker on my record and not be able to sell it in the Midwest or in Walmart or whatever. <laughs> can we, can we just, you know, not have those in there? And the guy was very respectful, but he just said, you know, we've been trying so long to get a record deal. You know, if we're going to get one now, it's going to be on our terms, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, okay. I, I said, well, you know what? And maybe something Roadrunner would be interested in, uh, you know. So I, I, I sent it over to Monty. Monty was really keen on it. He goes, "Yeah, case is coming in. We're gonna have an A&R meeting. I, I wanna, I wanna bring this up to, to, uh, to the guys. You know." He goes, "Tell me about the band. Uh, how old are they?" And I said, "Well, you know, they're around 30. Oh, forget it. Yeah, <laughs> forget, forget it, forget it." I get laughed out of the room. Something like that. I remember the exact quote, but it was something like I, something as if like I get laughed out of the room. I go, what do you mean? He goes, Mike, we're signing guys 20, 21, 22. You know, we're not working with people that old. That, that's not, that's not what we do here or mm -hmm. something, something along those lines. And I, I was really kind of let down because I, I thought, well, you know, I let these guys down by telling them that I, I wasn't going to sign them because I really didn't want to put, parental advisory stickers on my record, you know, and, and, uh, and I thought I had found them something else possibly, yeah. you know, and then, and then that's when I realized that, you know, I'm signing these prog rock bands and some of them, you know, might have two guys that are 200 and something pounds in the band yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. with short hair, with, sh with short hair, you know, and that, that, that are 35 or 40 years old. I mean, <laughs> I'd sign blues guys that were 40 years old or mm. whatever. Like I, I was not, you know, in, in the blues genre, the jazz fusion genre and the progressive rock genre, we weren't, the looks weren't, that wasn't really the deal. You know, it, it was, it was about the playing and the music, you know? Yeah, and, sure. and I know even for Roadrunner, it was about the music, but you also had to be a certain age and look a certain way. And yeah, yeah. That, that was like that way for shrapnel, in the glory days of, uh, of creating guitar heroes. But then fr from that, you know, as I got older, you know, I started the blues label and we did Magna Carta and with Pete and we did, uh, I did uh, tone center, the jazz label, fusion label. And, you know, I'm working with guys that are, you know, 60 years old, <laughs> 70 years <laughs> old, stuff like that. 65, 4, 55, 60, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't an issue anymore. So I guess when I approached Monty with that band, it never even entered my mind that, you know, they might not be interested in them be, because of their age, because they, they look cool and they were and they were great. And so I guess that that's the kind of thing, like by never being a huge label on one hand, on the other hand, I could always do what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, so if, if there wasn't an issue with having the swearing on the record, I would have put that, <laughs> that band's record out, you know. <laughs> And, and and I'm sure that probably would have done better than it did, but um, mm. well, I mean that's I, how it how it goes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean yeah. maybe I, I, it's possibly maybe not, but um, yeah, it it um, I don't know. I just I just had a different. The thing also was that I always I knew that if I broke an artist, at some point there'd become a time where they think I was holding them back. Yeah. Right. So. I had something in my agreement that said, if the artist, you know, get, if we get an offer from a major label, then the artist can, can leave my label as long as I get to participate with, 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 with something, you know? And so it was like, you know, give me a couple of points or give me something like that, you know, mm -hmm. and we'll, 
there, there, there was some kind of way where we could just sort of groom people and they could be picked, they could be picked from us. Sure. And then I, I would be able to kind of uh, still receive something going forward. But that way, nobody could sit there and tell me that I was holding him back. Because yeah, yeah. It, it, one thing as a guitar player, you know, and a musician first early on, I didn't want to tell people anything that wasn't true or unrealistic. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> I would paint them where I paint bad pictures for people, you know, because I wouldn't want them complaining to me. You told me I was going to be, you know, drive flying in a jet and living in a mansion. You know, I mean, you know, I, I never, I never created, you know, any, any, you know, I'm sure some people probably created, uh, you know, uh, those visions for themselves. But I mean, for me, I was, you know, pretty adamant Realistic. about sort of keep, keeping it real going, Hey, I'm a small label, you know, uh, you know, this is kind of what we can, what we can offer. Yeah. And, you know, if, if somebody bigger comes along, then, you know, we can work something out where you can go with them and I will just, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get some, I'll get something, you know, for it. And, you know, and we even had stuff built into the contracts for some artists that allowed them to move forward if, and, and that, that was really the best of all. And I, I didn't know any other label that was doing that. It and, stands uh, to it, where, you, where you knew what your brand was. You knew it was, it was instrumental guitar virtuosity. Um, let's, let's leave out the swearing and the, the dark stuff. Yeah. So you had, you had to give people options. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and, and so it, it, and it's kind of funny because I started out with just doing, you know, uh, you know, record to record, right. With no, no five or seven record contracts or whatever. And then, around the time that I started doing stuff with case, I'm like, well, I want to create something to where if he's having a great thing over there that we can continue to make records. And you know what I'm saying? I, I needed to, I, I wanted to be more attractive as well, as far as, you know, having something that could, uh, that we could build, you know? So, yeah. uh, so that, that's why I, but, but I felt, I felt deserving of asking for more at that time because I had already proven something with a label and I'd secured, you know, international presence, you know, with, with the help of Roadrunner, uh, mm -hmm. through Roadrunner. And, uh, so yeah, that, that that's kind of where it was at. Um, and yeah, I, I, <laughs> no, I was, I was just going to say, I, I just sort of did things differently, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. uh, and it, it, it's, it's, it's worked out pretty well. It's um, yeah, what, no. else, what else is, is Shrapnel doing this year? I was, I was going to open with this actually in terms of what, what yeah. this year is looking well, like. I saw Shrapnel. that, you know, honestly, I, I guess kind of whatever, whatever I want to do. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I'm not compelled to do much of anything right now. And <laughs> uh, because I really don't know what to expect, you know, uh, in the streaming environment. Sure. Uh, it used to be where I go, okay, I'm going to spend X amount of money on this record, right? The case will give me, you know, roughly, it, it was, wasn't always half. Sometimes it was less. Sometimes it was more. It just depends on, you know, what the record is and whatnot, you know, and what the conditions were, we were making the, how we were making the records. But um, yeah. Um, and so right now I, I, I can't, I can't figure out, you know, a, a mathematical you know, <laughs> equation. Uh, I can't say, well, I got this unknown band here. I'm going to spend 15,000 making the record and yeah. uh, you know, and then I'm going to put it out and somehow I'm supposed to get back that 15,000 from streaming. I mean, it's, I think it's like $3,000 or and I don't, I may shouldn't even try to even guess. I, I one lawyer told me 5,000, one lawyer, one lawyer told me it was 3000 something. So I don't, not sure what it is exactly. Right. But, I know that per million streams, <laughs> you get you can get a few thousand dollars, mm. and I know to get a million streams, you know, it, it, you know, uh, for instrumental guitar these days, it, you know, probably not the easiest thing to do, yeah. and uh, unfortunately, you know, I mean, I, I've said this for years, but like the guys that Napster and the, mm -hmm. Spotify or whatever, or even Apple, you know, uh, you know there wasn't a huge investment in these artists, you know, or in no. their recordings or, or the recordings or whatever. And, and what nobody failed to, the people failed to take into consideration is that, Hey, this artist who is 60 years old, that's has a whole body of work recorded in real recording studios with real accomplished engineers and professionals, you know, 
he might not want to make that record in his house, hmm. you know, and might not have the ability to do it, might not have the equipment or might not know how to run it or might not be interested in the slightest how to do that because he knows what <laughs> his job is and that's to be great at playing guitar. And yeah. so the problem that we have now is that, you know, some of these artists are probably going to say, I don't want to make another record because, yeah. you know, There's no incentive. I'm probably, I'm probably not going to make a lot of money doing it. And I can't have the great sidemen on the record that I want and fly them around and pay someone to record it with the kind of budget that someone's going to give me. And yeah. so unfortunately, and the craziest thing is no offense to anyone. I think right now is the, maybe the most exciting time for music ever. And, mm. and <laughs> unfortunately, you know, uh, the infrastructure's, you know, crumbled. So it, it's, you know, being reinvented, you know, is, is every day. So, you know, at some point, hopefully it, it, it gets figured out again. And I know obviously people that have, you know, pop, pop hits and we're able to connect with social media and yeah. do all the things you're supposed to do nowadays to have a big uh, record. I know to the people that have solved those problems, uh, you know, the, the, some of them are doing really, really well. But as far as the, the indie blues artist or the indie, you know, shred mm -hmm. guy, I don't know. I mean, my question is, you know, back when I, in the seventies, a guy like Tommy Dorsey or something was, you know, big in the thirties and forties, you know, and my parents maybe in the seventies listened to him when they were dating in the, you know, in the late thirties and married in the early forties or whatever. And so, or mid or whatever it was, uh, I guess 45, something like that. So, I mean, so that's what they were listening to. So, I mean, it, it, at a certain point in time, I mean, how realistic is it to even continue making records and expect the people that, are out there that like this stuff 40 years ago that they're even going to buy anything. Mm. I mean, that, you know, I, I came over to my house. I still collect CDs. I love CDs and I, I buy them like crazy. And so I came over to my house and I pulled out this stuff that it cost a bunch of money to find these things. So they're out of print, you know, and I'm playing them for him. And when he's done, he goes, thanks. I got 20, just picked up 20 of those, those discs you were playing. <laughs> I just picked them up on Apple music. And I go, damn, that CD on Apple music. <laughs> he goes, yeah, the download, download. I go, that thing's been out of print for five years and it goes for 80 bucks on Amazon or whatever. And you go, well, I just downloaded it. And it's part of my $9 a month, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and I thought, God, to buy that media, you know, it cost me a minimum of probably three, 400 bucks. And then this guy just got all this stuff, you know, for I mean, one, one of the things he got, it's like over a hundred dollars now. It goes for and, and it's, he, it's, there's never been more money in especially metal though these days i think it's because what people are wising up to as a response to all this is the uh the retail product which is the bundles the vinyl bundles um yeah. putting things with tickets and things like that so i think in terms yeah. of the numbers there hasn't ever been more there's never been more money in metal it's just how Why people not? have utilized it well I, i'm a huge stoner rock fan Mm -hmm. Although I'm not a stoner, but um, I love the music that's in that. Generally speaking, and the you know, this, and, and maybe not some of the lyrics all the time, but you know, the stoner rock and the, and the stoner psych rock, and there's all these festivals that are happening around the world. Uh, there's a festival called Psycho Vegas. You might get a kick out of seeing who plays there. It's it's an awesome metal festival, but mm -hmm. it's sort of around that stoner rock kind of theme. And it just goes on for like four days and it has all kinds of huge bands come in and play it. And uh, I'll look at it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's a psycho Vegas psycho and every Vegas. year. Yeah. It, it, this year might be less because of, you know, the fact that we're dealing with COVID and stuff like that. But in the past, it's had some amazing lineups of newer underground, you know, underground bands <laughs> from all over, all over the world. Most full um, yeah, there you go. That's right. <laughs> All comes back right. around. Yeah, they're, they're 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 playing this year. So, um, so yeah, I think this is a great time for for music. And uh, I wish I knew. You know, at a certain point, everybody sort of you know loses touch. You know, and um, I'm I'm buying all kinds of new music and mm. and and and, uh, and whatnot and, and love it. Um, but as far as like knowing how to navigate the social media thing and 
a lot of the older artists that you know that I like, I mean, they don't want to do that. They never had to do that. Yeah. The idea of giving people transparency into their lives and their what they had for dinner and you know <laughs> what their favorite movie is and you know all that kind of crap. It it, it really. It really it's, is kind of. It's, I call it's it the purposeful. engagement. It's, it's, it's the engagement economy. That's what I call it. You need yeah, well, um, you need people to like it. You need people to subscribe to it, and you need a number of views per week to make your rent. And I yeah. I can't subscribe to that personally, even though I'm, I'm yeah. this is a podcast and I've got to try and get some clout behind it. I'm not <laughs> I'm not bothered. <laughs> it just doesn't yeah. interest me. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's it's just um yeah. It, it, it's going to be uh, interesting to see all this how this all shakes out. And the kind of the sad thing is though, there are all these great bands, but you know, this one band, I, I, I think I, yeah, I think I approached Monty. I think I approached uh, metal blade and to me, the band, I mean, they're touring, they're doing festivals. They've got, you know, followers They to me, it all looks pretty good. But when you're looking to get in that, you know, the, the top fraction of a percent, you know, get mm. through that eye of the needle, you know, what may look good to me being out of touch, you know, apparently, you know, isn't good, you know, for them, uh, given what the opportunities they have with other things. Right. So, yeah. Um, and so it, it's just, um, it's sad though. Cause finally af after pitching one of these bands to a few labels, Oh, we just got a deal with so-and-so. I said, well, what did you get? Uh, they're giving us 200 copies of vinyl and 50 of the CD. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then what kind of royalty points? What royalty points? I mean, what are you getting per disc they sell? Huh? What are you ask? What are you asking me? What royalty are you getting? Royalty? No, we're getting 200 copies of the vinyl and 50 of the CD. Mm. Okay, <laughs> so it. yeah, but I'm serious. This is happening all over the place. Those, wow. those are record deals. Those are record deals. And 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 you know. <laughs> I went to, you know, to the merch booth after one of these festivals and I'm talking to this guy and I go, so there's two other records you have, right? I'd like to get them. Yeah. I don't know when I'm going to have enough money to repress them if, mm -hmm. you know, and there's all these bands that are, I think are really good, but they'll press 300 CDs and like 400 vinyl and they're done. And then they're yeah. on to the next record. Yeah. You know, you're kidding. You know, crazy. What, what, I know about so many bands that I think are really, really great, but like, you know, there's such a small amount of, of records that they make. And like I said, some of these deals, you know, are so small. Mm -hmm. it, it's, you know, like the, in that deal I just told you, the band paid for the record themselves. Yeah. You know, and, it's mad. And, I'm, I, and I might be getting a couple of different bands mixed up. So uh, I apologize if that is, but because there were a couple of bands I was trying to help out. But all, all I'm saying is, is that, um, yeah, clearly, uh, the guys that are still in the game, like Monty and whatnot, and Brian Slagle, I mean, they know what's going on. You yeah. know, I'm definitely not, you know, up on this stuff. And so, like I said, something can sound really good to me, but, but you know, I, I'm like, you know, somebody's grandfather or something. So it, it's, <laughs> it's whatever. <laughs> but what I think sounds good, you know, I remember I was working with some artist who was pretty old and he goes, no, we got to put that in here for the kids and their headphones. <laughs> I, I said, okay, look. I don't think any kids are going to listen to your record. I mean, you're, you know, old enough to be, you, you, you follow what I mean. I, I have to ask myself when I was 21 years old, you know, 22, when I started shrapnel, how many records were I listening to by guys over 30? Yeah. You know, <laughs> not a lot, you know, some, but not a lot, you know? And so, you know, the thought that a kid's going to be buying up these records, is probably not the case, yeah. you know, yeah. although kids are a little more, uh, open-minded than we were like there's still so you'll find some kids that like led zeppelin or pink floyd and some that like them too much like Greta van fleet but um mm -hmm. but obviously you know um that that was a that could have been or hopefully is a, a door opener for some other bands you know that want to play rock because yeah you know um yeah i, I don't i don't know how this that follow-up is, is doing but um i know they sure made an impa Im impact here you know with the uh their tour and everything um, yeah the likes over here as well I'm not quite sure what they're selling in terms of um, the live dates or anything but I know that they definitely get a lot of airplay on the very few rock radio stations that we have over here anyway hey Jim good talking with you and I hope you got some stuff there that, that's, that's worth something oh yeah and, totally um, I'll keep in touch um, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll keep you appraised of the project